In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. O God, who has instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant that by the same Spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, Saint John, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. To begin, I would like to thank all of you for your fiat to God's vocation, to his call to holiness, and for those who have responded to the call to sacred orders, to the, the ordained a, a priest of the new and eternal covenant, I thank you, as, as well as the religious brothers who are here, who are deeply in their baptism through their consecration, and uh, laity who, who are baptized and striving to be saints by living their, you know, their confirmation and uh, the Holy Eucharist and live life, abundant life, eternal life. I wanted to uh, share with you that my heart's really been moved in, in the times that I've had to share with a number of you, uh, listening to how God has worked in your life, and it rejoices my heart. I, I just want to say that, uh, and, and I, that must really rejoice the heart of Jesus and our Blessed Mother, uh, certainly our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit who's been working in your life, knowing that a vocation is gift and mystery. I mean, that, that was the book St. John Paul II wrote on the 50th anniversary of his ordination, Gift and Mystery. But what I've had the joy of experiencing in all of you that I've, I've met is the witness of how humility, mercy, and service come together. Humility, mercy, and service come together. We see that in Jesus, especially in the Eucharist, but of course the Eucharist flows from his sacrifice on the cross and uh, was in the eternal mind of God, and then Jesus assumed our human nature, by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, but humility, mercy, and service. And you can see humility, mercy, and service in the Eucharist and Our Lady. And the cross. These three mysteries, the Eucharist, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the wisdom of the cross all come together. And St. John understood this well as he placed his head on the heart of Jesus. He was close to the heart of Jesus. That means he was able to penetrate the mystery and embrace it in his interior life. And think about it. Okay, humility. We, we look at the Eucharist, how humble our Lord is in the Most Holy Eucharist. We even said that prayer the other day as, as we have Eucharistic adoration, our Lord will share his humility with us and all his virtues with us. But humility is, is, is seen in the Most Holy Eucharist. At the Last Supper, Jesus commenced the Last Supper by washing feet, demonstrating humility that also is tied to fraternal charity. And we'll get there. But 
the humility of the Eucharist, and then the humility of Our Lady, as seen in all the mysteries of the Rosary, Our Lady's life, and the humility of Jesus on the cross. It's beautiful how on the cross you see both how humility and courage come together. You see in the God-man, Jesus Christ, you see the perfect humility of God on the cross, but you also see the perfect courage of man on the cross. A lot of people separate those two, but humility and courage go together, as does service and kingship. <laughs> you see that on the cross. So many lessons. St. Bonaventure, we're in the room of these doctors of the church, St. Bonaventure said he learned more by looking at the crucifix than any other way, right? And Thomas Aquinas as well learned so much contemplating on the crucifix. But we have humility, and then we have mercy. Mercy. The Most Holy Eucharist really is a sacrament of mercy, God's merciful love, the divine love that he has. He, he would not leave us orphans, and so he's with us until the end of the age, ages uh, in his mercy to feed us with his body, blood, soul, and divinity where he's really, truly, and substantially present. We need his strength to do his will. Uh, the Eucharist, the, a real sacrament of mercy. And then you see Our Lady, <laughs> Mother of Mercy, Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, our hope, and, you know, the Hail Holy Queen, so, so beautiful, so true. But also you find Mary understanding in her humility, how great God is. And because she had this understanding with perfect faith about the work of God in her life, including in the work of the Immaculate Conception, giving her that prevenient grace that kept her without stain from the moment of her conception, Without stain, immaculate means without stain, not just without sin, but without stain. She never stained anything with her ego. Everything was pure for God, loving God with all her heart, her heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving her neighbor as herself for the love of God. But she understood the mercy that was shown to her in the Immaculate Conception, and that really relates to her title as Refuge of sinners, if you reflect on it, I, I don't have time to develop it for you, but I, it's worthy of a conference in and of itself, how the Immaculata, I am the Immaculate Conception. It's not just that she was immaculately conceived. When she revealed her name to Bernadette on March 25th in Lourdes on the Feast of the Annunciation, she said, I am the Immaculate Conception. A concept, God's concept in his mind from all eternity. Mary is that Immaculate Concept. That's who she is. I am the Immaculate Conception. And we're all conceptions of God, according to St. Maximilian Marie Kolbe. Let us be faithful to that concept God had for us and has for us from all eternity. But Mary understood the mercy that was shown to her so well, that's how she can actually be a refuge of sinners. Because some people would say, well, you're immaculately conceived, you were without sin. I, so, some people, it hurts me when they say this. I, I can't relate to Mary because she, was, you know, she lived a life of perfect virtue and perfection, and I'm a sinner. Well, but Mary understood God's mercy shown to her so deeply that she's able to show that mercy to sinners. You understand? And so actually, 
her title as Immaculate Conception, I Am the Immaculate Conception, goes well with Refuge of Sinners and Mother of Mercy. So humility, mercy, and service. We see the service of God in the Eucharist. We see the mercy of God in the Eucharist. We see the humility of God in the Eucharist. We see in Mary the humility that she displayed, her mercy, and her service. Her whole life was given to serving the will of God, totally, always doing the will of the Father. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. And that brings me to the importance of the Angelus. Sometimes uh, I try to help people understand the, the depths of the Angelus, how in, in so many of our prayers, so many of our prayers, the deep truths of our faith are contained in simple ways. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. What did we talk about in this morning's conference? How when Mary and the Holy Spirit are together, Jesus becomes present, right? The key to holiness. The relationship with Our Lady and the Holy Spirit. And then we pray a Hail Mary. And I also want to share with you, brothers, that if you pray the Hail Mary with the same joy that the angel Gabriel had the first time he said, Kyrie, Kyritomene, rejoice, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. When, when you're praying that way, it's going to change the way we pray the Hail Mary, the Ave Maria. Pray with that disposition of, 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 of the angel Gabriel sent by the Trinity to announce this plan of God. But we, we have the Angelus, so the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit, Mary and the Holy Spirit. Then, behold the handmaid of the Lord, her humility, be it done unto me according to thy word. And this is a great teaching for God's people. How can you say, be it done unto me according to thy word, unless you know the word of God? We need to inspire everybody to enter into the word of God. Within the last couple of years, we all experienced something that we never thought was possible, ever. Every church in the world was closed. Never, how could that be possible? Well, I hope that gave us all time for meditation and contemplation and time for a rethink of how we're going to form the laity should something happen and they won't have maybe access to the church, but in the history of different countries, the faith has stayed alive with the laity. In Japan, for example, for hundreds of years. In India, when, when St. Uh, Francis Xavier went over there, He, he found a number of, of people, locals, that already knew the Catholic faith, and he asked them, you know, where'd they get their faith? And they said, St. Thomas. St. <laughs> <Saint> Thomas? <laughs> 1,500 years ago? Korea, the faith basically was brought there by the lay faithful, you know? Uh, they got, got these books, these Catholic books, and, and educated people started, you know, praying the faith, or the faith has survived in, with people praying the, ro the rosary, or I was told the story of our mission down there where I am right now in Belize on the border of Guatemala, and uh, our, the priest who started that mission there for our community, Father John McHugh, he would spend most of the weekdays over on the Guatemala side, he would say a number of masses on Sunday and on, uh, on the Belize side and then go over to Guatemala. 
And honestly, one time a man came to the main parish over there, Martin de Porres, in Guatemala, in Melchor, Guatemala, and asked Father to come visit his village. And he said, sure, meet me at a certain time. And he went out there to this village. And, and a lot of these missions they got to by horseback or however they got there. Now, this was only like 50 years ago, right? And Father McHugh went out there to this village and they were so happy. They hadn't seen a priest for 100 years. And, and, and this is one of the things that sends chills through me, that, 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 that he was so happy that, that he did about, I, f I forget what the exact numbers were, but uh, something like 8 to 14 weddings and all kinds of baptisms and, I mean, just total sacramental service to God's people. What a joy, right? We, let's not lose sight of the fact that we belong to this Catholic church. That's our mother. But we need to get God's people ready for whatever might come, without being alarmist. I, I'm not an alarmist, but I'm a realist. Look at the trajectory of things. We need to, we need to have people understand the word of God, even if, even if everything stays kind of status quo, which, I don't know, that isn't so wonderful. But, uh, you know, we need the new evangelization. But anyway, people need to know the word of God so that when, you know, be it done unto me according to thy word, like Mary. She knew the word of God. When, when, when the announcement came, the Lord is with you, she knew from Scripture in the Old Testament, when the Lord is with you, that means he's going to do a direct intervention in the history of mankind. The Lord is with you. Remember Gideon, for example? You can take a lot of examples. The Lord is with you. She knew what that meant. She's pondering. Then we pray a Hail Mary, and then, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, St. John's Gospel, verse 14, right? The incarnation. And then, you know, we say, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. And we say, pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. There's the rosary prior to the illusion. The, the, the luminous mysteries, the incarnation, the cross, and the glorious mysteries, right? The last Sunday in the holy season of Advent is known as Angelus Sunday. So, so much is contained in the Angelus to teach people. But I'm trying to focus initially on humility, mercy, service. And so I hope you see humility mercy, service in the Eucharist, humility, mercy, service in Our Lady, and clearly, humility, mercy, service in the wisdom of the cross, right? They all go together, and that's holiness, humility, mercy, service. While I'm speaking of prayers, the Divine Mercy Chaplet contains so much, so many riches. Sometimes when I'm giving a Eucharistic retreat, on the Our Father beads, we say, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. What are we offering right there? We're offering the Eucharist. Body, blood, soul, and divinity, right? And of course, he's really, truly, and substantially present. There's always these seven marks of the, of the Eucharist everyone needs to know. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. Most really don't know the soul relationship with Christ, the mind of Christ, the will of Christ, the memories of Christ, the heart of Christ. Body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ who's really, truly, and substantially present. Those seven marks of the Eucharist. But we pray, Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. And then when I'm praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet, 
The first decade, I, it's basically like the Sorrowful Mysteries. I go to the garden, and then I go, and, and for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, as he's praying in, in the garden and just, you know, entering deeply into that prayer, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and the whole world. But then I need to go back to the Eucharist. Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world, to go to the scourging. Then I have to go back to the Eucharist to get the strength to go to the crowning with thorns. Then I have to go back to the Eucharist to get the strength to carry the cross. And let me note that the first station standing before Pilate Standing before the powers of this world, so to be, brothers, we're going to be there. What an honor it will be. We need the strength of the Eucharist. We need to know we're beloved. All the things we've talked about in this retreat, or, and I hate to say talked about, the things we've, we, we, we've meditated upon, the things we're embracing now, the, the truths that are in our hearts, we need the strength of the Eucharist to stand before the powers of this world. And say, we're not going to close our church doors. You can do with me whatever you want. I'm going to go anoint the dying. Because I'm a priest, and that's what I'm ordained for. I'm going to stand up for life as sacred from conception to natural death. I'm only going to marry one man to one woman. We need the strength of the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is humility, mercy, and service. Mary witnesses humility, mercy, service. And the cross, humility, mercy, service. Okay? But I see that in you, brothers. That, that, that's what really struck me earlier today in, 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 in preparing for tonight's conference. I wanted to... I wanted to affirm you in that. I really have met, I, I've got to spend time with many of you, and you're beautiful. You really are beautiful. It really lifts me up. You know, we're united, and there's only one priesthood, and I, I rejoice that you're, you're priest, and there's religious brothers, and there's laity seeking to be holy. So, Our founder, here's a couple of things that he would direct us to. Our holy founder, Father James Flanagan, would say basically our life needs to become a holocaust of charity in the goodness of the Father. That's a good definition of the cross. That's rich. That's deep. A holocaust of charity in the goodness of the Father. A holocaust of charity in the goodness of the Father. A holocaust is totally consumed, right? Total offering. A holocaust of charity in the goodness of the Father. But here was the definition our founder would give us of charity. Our founder would say, charity is to esteem the goodness of the Father in everyone and everything. To esteem the goodness of the Father in everyone and everything. If you're seeing the goodness of the Father in everyone and everything, you're going to find the strength to love. Our minds are made for truth and our wills are made for the good, right? So esteeming the goodness of the Father and everyone and everything, when you look around the world, instead of looking at the darkness, look, at, look for goodness. And, and I know you know this, brothers, but it's just good for us to remind each other this because it's, it's so easy to get caught up in pointing out the darkness. It's so visible and so palpable. But, you know, deep down, everybody's got some of that goodness in them. And for us to bring that goodness forth. So that's a de good definition of charity. It starts with that esteeming the goodness of the Father and everyone and everything. And then humility, our founder shared with me that, that basically is to come to the realization that you need everybody. 
Our founder was a World War II veteran, uh, basically a Navy SEAL before they were Navy SEALs, underwater demolition things that they would do. They would, they would swim, and they, they basically had a, a watch and uh, some ways to go and... Uh, they would tie, they would be get dropped off and they would go look for all the, the underwater bombs that were there for the, the ships and they had to time out how they were going to explode all these bombs so the ships could come in and they actually, when the, time, when the, when the explosion was going to take place, they had to lay on their back because the, the, the concussion was so intense, if you were laying on your stomach, it might hurt your, your insides, right? And so he was training off the coast of China, you know, near, in World War II, and, and, and so, and then he played football on uh, a number of national championship teams under Leahy, Coach Leahy at Notre Dame, right? But he, you know, he, he, he was the type of, of, of man, he, he shared with me from his heart, he said, when I was young, I didn't want to need anybody but he said, I've come to the point of needing everybody. And he really witnessed, from the time we knew him, he was one of the humblest people I've ever met. When you come to the, the realization, I need everybody. I need all of you. Nobody has all the gifts. We need each other. And so we were always taught to see in the order of gift and love. The Holy Spirit, as you know, is person, gift, person, love. But to see everyone as a gift, that's... That's what our, our co-founder, who was actually the most joyful human being I've ever met in my life, really lived so close to Our Lady. All he'd ever say, anytime he'd, I'd ask him direction, <laughs> he was so holy, but he'd just say, give it to Our Lady, give it to Our Lady. Part of me used to be, was like, is that all you can say? But it's so true, just give it to Our Lady. And that means don't take it back. Give it to Our Lady and don't take it back. That, that's my problem. I take it back, okay? I, I give it to Our Lady, but, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not getting the answer I want quick enough. I'm taking it back. Give it to Our Lady. But the secret for joy for him was to see everything as a gift. Now, he was in World War II as well. He would be in those bombers that flew from England over Nazi Germany, and it was pretty much guaranteed you were going to get shot down. And in fact, he did get shot down and was only one of four who lived from that plane crash and was in a Nazi prison camp. And he shared with me part of his learning humility was, you know, when you realize, you know, that whole experience of, you know, people died around you and God saved you for a reason but to be humble and to be little, but to see everything as a gift, everything in life as a gift, um, circumstances, uh, God's providence is wonderful, but the order of gift and love, that's, that's where we become joyful and become a, an attraction to people, and that will convert the world. When we help people see the goodness in them and help them see things in gift and love. And so we need to stay close to the heart of Jesus, in this mystery of the Most Holy Eucharist, the wisdom of the cross, and the gift of the Blessed Mother. To close in this, uh, this kind of subject, or this kind of sharing with you, and, and, and many of these concepts are contained in the Insinu Yesu. I mean, you can go, as we went through those 12 different areas, but there's many more concepts in here. But fraternal charity is so important. This goes along with the Eucharist and Our Lady and the wisdom of the cross that John was able to understand or start to enter into the mystery by placing his head on the heart, heart of Jesus. These always go together. You never separate the Eucharist and Our Lady and the wisdom of the cross. But fraternal charity, back to Jesus washing feet and, and saying, love each other as I have loved you. And he's saying that to his disciples, to his priests. There's so, so much richness in his washing the feet. 
the way that we, we need to be pure before receiving the Eucharist, but also to be a part of him. But also, what happened when, when Moses saw the burning bush? What did God say to him? Take off your sandals. This is holy ground. Jesus is taking off their sandals and washing their feet because the Eucharist is holy ground. Wow. You understand? Everything goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And I want to give credit to this missionary, a charity sister who gave that one to me. So it's, it's not like I'm, you know, I came up with all this. <laughs> I'm not that holy. I want to be, you know, to be a saint, it, you got to desire it. That, that's what Thomas Aquinas told his sister. Remember, she asked him, what does it take to be a saint? What's the key to be a saint? After St. Thomas Aquinas wrote so many, you know, wonderful truths, and he wrote them actually for others. His answer to his sister about how to become a saint was one word in Latin, vele, vele, want it, want it. Hunger, thirst, long, desire, yearn for it. St. Teresa of Avila, her word would be determination. But it starts with this desire, a holy desire, and God gives us that desire. But desire, don't give up. Vele, will it. Keep that fixed loving gaze on God. But coming to charity where holiness is manifest, especially in the love of God and love of neighbor. Love of neighbor actually perfects charity. Loving God is easy. Loving humans? Well... They're made in the image and likeness of God, but, you know, and, and Mother Teresa used to say, you know, love Jesus in the, the distressing disguise of the poor. But, but, but what happens when all these demands are on us, brothers, when people come to us and, and, and their, their brokenness in their, their need for food or, or, or water in some countries, but mostly their need for the Eucharist and the waters of baptism and, and penance that comes from the heart of Jesus and the divine mercy, right? The rays that come from his heart, the Eucharist and baptism and penance. But people come to us in their loneliness. St. Mother Teresa would say, the greatest suffering is to be nobody to anybody. That's quite a quote, huh? The greatest suffering is to be nobody to anybody. And believe me, in this cancel culture, a lot of people are experiencing that. To be nobody to anybody. That's a suffering. You know, there's physical suffering, but there's emotional and psychological and mental and spiritual, what, what they call moral suffering, you know, in, in your heart. To be nobody to anybody. But to love others is where we're perfected because if you... To love others means we're going to be able to start loving the way God loves, and we need to pray for that grace. We draw the strength from the sacrament of charity, the Eucharist. Because we, then we'll have that Eucharistic heart of Jesus, especially through our, our adoration, but our, our worthy celebration of the Mass that we'll get to. But uh, tomorrow we're really going to enter more deeply into the Mass and, and, and the gift of the Holy Sacrifice, the Mass, and the gift of the Eucharist, but I, I still want to share some important concepts before we, we, we go there on, on Thursday, tomorrow. Um, if you love somebody, you love who they love, right? Well, Jesus loves humanity, so much so that he assumed our human nature. In him is, is God and man in the natures, right? He's a divine person with two natures, right? And so he's showing us his love for humanity. But that's where we're going to be perfected. And so that's why community is actually such a blessing. Now, diocesan priest, uh, a, a holy diocesan priest shared with me, you know, you know actually the, the path for one of the ways for diocesan priests to be holy is to have that union with the bishop and the presbyterate and, and to be committed to the pastoral plan of the diocese, okay? To have that unity of the brotherhood. 
Whereas I belong to a religious community, and, and the brothers here belong to religious communities, and some of you belong to, uh, uh, you know, communities that are even in, 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 in amongst diocesan priests uh, in supporting each other. Community is a beautiful way to get purified and to grow in holiness. St. John of the Cross, in his counsels to religious, basically says, remember, everybody in the community is an instrument to purify you. Now, I don't walk around, and like we have one of our community members here, and I say, well, you know, there's my, um, there's my, my, my hammer, you know, and there's my, my, the file, and there's the anvil. Um, I'm actually the, 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 the most difficult instrument in the community, to be honest, but, you know, there's that aspect of being purified in love. And uh, to surrender our, our preferences and our egos and our wills and our tastes for the other. But every community needs a mother and a father. And so God the Father in heaven is our our father in the Catholic Church, and Mary's the mother. We belong to the church first and foremost. We need Mary as our mother, and she'll teach us about fraternal charity. So this brings me to an important sharing in the Insinu Yesu gift found on page 12 of Sunday, October 28th, 2007. And this is all about restoring fatherhood in the priesthood. We know there's a crisis of fatherhood in the world, right? That's why we're even having a vocations so-called crisis, but it's because of the brokenness in families, because of the lack of the fatherhood, the witness of the father, and you can trace it all back to artificial contraception and the selfishness that flows from artificial contraception, and then the theological horror of some saying there's a theology of descent. Jesus never said anything about descent, ever. And I don't need to name those individuals who started this kind of lie from hell or perpetrated it. But we need to restore fatherhood. God, God knows what's going on. God's got it in control. God is God. Some, it's good to go to the creed sometimes when you're, you're having a struggle or you're you know, challenged and you feel overwhelmed, just the very, very first article, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. That's our Father, Almighty. Not sometimes mighty, not part-time mighty, not mighty when he's asleep. Our Father is Almighty. Amen? That's my dad. You know, that's our Father. So here's, here's the sharing, and... and, and Father Don Mark Kirby shared that this was the first time the Father spoke to him. You see that in the italicized part, but it's so, so rich and so important, and, I, and I, it was worthy of a whole conference and definitely of a reflections later on. That this whole retreat was basically to lay some foundations for reflections later on, either to deepen some things that are in you, but to plant some seeds for reflections later on, right? Okay. So here's the sharing from Jesus, or from the Father. Faith in my fatherhood will be the path of healing for many who, like you, were kept from growing up in freedom and joy beneath the gaze of their father. See, there's the father wound. If you did not grow up with that freedom and joy, under the gaze of a loving father, and no human father's perfect, 
And it's not right to put on your father, well, you should have been perfect. You don't know what their father was like and their father's father and their father's father and their father's father. You can't give what you don't have. So, so priests, that's why formation is so important. You can't give what you don't have, right? But we need to restore fatherhood. And so God the Father, you know, sends his son, Jesus, who says, when you see me, you see the Father. And Jesus' whole life was about glorifying the Father. What was the, what's the first recorded words in sacred scripture of Jesus? What are the first recorded words in the finding of Jesus at the temple? I must be about my father's business or I must be in my father's house. What was Jesus' last words on the crucifix? Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. In between those, those words, the father and I are one. Everything, the father, the father. I, I don't do my own will. I do the father's will. The father, the father, the father. Knowing the importance of fatherhood. So living in a time, in an age where there's this father wound, and, 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 and this came from the beginning. This, this actually was the, the worst harm that came from original sin. There were many, 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 many wounds that came from original sin. We know all those things about the darkening of the mind and the weakening of the will and the loss of, of, of the strength of the virtues and the disorder of the appetites and, you know, the, 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 the passions. But the greatest wound was that man could not call God Father anymore. We need the Holy Spirit to call God Abba, right? The heaven was closed, after original sin, Jesus opened heaven again, restored the relationship with the Father. You understand? But the devil has been distorting the image of the Father from the beginning of the original sin. Did he really tell you you can't eat of that tree? Of the knowledge of good and evil? Well... Wouldn't that have been beautiful if we never needed to know evil? All we needed to do was to know good? That was God's original plan. You don't need to know evil. Man is not the judge of what's good and what's evil. God is good, and he's going to just let, let us live in goodness. But the devil makes the, God as like he's the big policeman up in the sky, or he just put things in motion, and he's remote and disinterested. All these lies from hell. And people are buying into them. They need to experience the Father. And Jesus says, when you see me, you see the Father. And we're ordained into Jesus, or at least we're baptized into Jesus for the, the religious and the, the laity, right? When people see you, do they see the Father? You know, when a baby's born, isn't it, isn't it amazing how, you know, the, the parents are so happy when a baby's born, and then they start to say, oh, he looks like you. No, he looks like you. Back and forth between the mom and the dad, right? We're supposed to look like our father, and we're supposed to look like our mother Mary too, right? So know the beauty of the face of Jesus. Contemplate his face and have his heart. And so that people will be able to grow up under the gaze of, of a loving father and experience true freedom and joy. True freedom, not license, but freedom to do the will of God. So, God the Father speaking to the Benedictine monk, and he's speaking to all of us who may have been wounded or are serving people who are wounded because they didn't have a, a loving father whose gaze they could grow up under with freedom and joy. The wound of abandonment. And they're always concerned that they're going to be abandoned, and that's why they really don't know that they're, they're loved. I mean, like fathers, when they're raising their, 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 their let's say, their sons, you know, and, and think about it. When a father takes his son and puts the son up on his shoulders... And it's walking around, and the, the little son is on the, on the shoulders of the dad. 
man, you're like, my dad's just the, the greatest. I can see everything from up here, right? I'm just, wow, you know, my dad can do anything. And then, you know, how, how a father, you know, throws his, his child in the air for, to teach the child trust, all these things. Some, some children have been denied that. I'll admit, I've ex- I, I had that experience as well. I have permission from my mother to share. You know, my parents were divorced, and uh, my dad loved me, though. I was number one son, and he was a man's man in Detroit and a, a, a a rod buster, a metal worker, a tied steel in pools, and, you know, taught me many things, came to my baseball games and sports and things. But, you know, the, the experience of the, the breakup of the family, there's a wound there. But God can heal that. I tell you the truth, God can heal it. Uh, really, he can and sometimes you have to realize the, 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 the root of, of the, the sense of abandonment. And so then you're going you're gonna to find security in your own systems as opposed to in God. And, and, and we need to trust God and abandon ourselves. To be a saint, part of it, I like the letters ST, surrender and trust. ST, surrender and trust. Surrender and trust. I don't know if you all have prayed that surrender novena. It's really powerful, the surrender novena. But... You know, surrender and trust. But if you have a wound, you know, all human parts want love. They want to be significant to somebody, and they want security. But when there's a father wound, that sense of love and significance and security comes under attack, and then you can try to fill it with other things. So the restoration of the fatherhood, especially through the priesthood, is going to help people be healed. And so then the next line, the father is speaking to the priest who had his own father wound, apparently. He says, I want to banish fear from your life. In the sacred scriptures, we're told in one form or another, 365 times, be not afraid. One for every day of the year. God's so wise. I want to banish fear from your life. And what's surrounding us right now? We need to have people move from fear to faith. The father goes on. I want you to feel loved and surrounded by my presence as a father. A presence that supports you. That will not hold you back from becoming the man that I have always wanted you to be a presence that will allow you, in turn, to become a father, a father in my image, a father as my Jesus was fully a father in the midst of his disciples. They discovered my fatherhood in his countenance. They sensed it in drawing close to his heart. They saw it at work in the signs of mercy and of power that he worked in my name. It must be so for you. Be the image of my fatherhood by means of the fatherly love that I shall place in your heart. Be my instrument for the healing of many who did not know what it is to be loved by a father. The fatherhood of the priest is a grace that I shall renew in the church now. That's powerful. The fatherhood of the priest is a grace that I shall renew in the church now. It is when a priest is father that he corresponds to my designs of love upon him. The church, the beloved spouse of my only begotten son, suffers in that so many priests do not know how to live the grace of their fatherhood. Souls ask for fathers. Souls ask for fathers. Souls ask for fathers. And too often they are sent away, abandoned to live like spiritual orphans. You, 
Be a father. Receive the graces and energies of my fatherhood in your soul. This is God's work. He'll give us the graces and energies of fatherhood. The more a priest lives his fatherly mission, the more he will resemble my son who said, he who sees me sees the father. And then the father says to the Benedictine monk, but to us as well, you, yeah, you know, this is, he's, he, he's speaking this to us. I bless you, my son. I bless you to be a father for the praise of my glory. For the praise of my glory. We're supposed to be a, a praise of God's glory. That's straight in scripture. St. Paul says that. Uh, and, 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 and in Novo Millennio Inute, St. John Paul II, as at the turn of the third Christian millennium, talks about us becoming a hymn of praise to the glory of God. That's what our life should be, a hymn of praise to the most holy trinity. That's what our life should be, the praise of God's glory. Jesus spent his whole life glorifying the Father, and we continued that by making the Father manifest. And so we're blessed to be fathers for the praise of God's glory and for the joy of the church of, of Jesus Christ. The Father says, the church of my son. Fatherhood is so important, we all know that. And so we can all talk about father wounds and talk to the, look to the problem, but let's be part of the solution. Let's start it. Let's pray for it. Jesus says, you can do nothing without me, but ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. Do you really want it? Vele? Do you want to be a saint? Do you want to be a father? I know. Being a father is demanding. Think about a father of a large family at the end of a, large day, a long day. And, and he wants to go get some rest, and, and he hears the child say, Daddy, you've had that happen, fathers, right? You're going back to the rectory, and you hear behind you, Father. <laughs> But many times, just like a, a natural father, those are the best conversations. That's when somebody's finally open up, right? They're open. They're ready at that point. And yeah, we're tired. <laughs> but just listen. Be present. Be a father. And great things are going to happen. So you can reflect on that. We're, we're going to have a holy hour shortly. But you'll be in the presence of Jesus and you'll see the Eucharistic face of our Lord. And you can think about humility, mercy, service, as well as fatherhood, just making it all simple. Now, I gave you some handouts, but we'll go into those tomorrow. I'm just giving those to you in advance, okay? So you don't need to really go over those. I just want to get those in your hands. You can bring those tomorrow which in God's providence is the Feast of St. John Vianney. Amazing. I, I wasn't even thinking about it when this retreat was scheduled. On Thursday, on Thursday, it's going to be the Feast of St. John Vianney? I mean, God loves us. Our Lady loves us. We're so blessed. And so uh, thank you again. I, I started off this conference trying to show gratitude to all of you, and I'm not just saying it. I can see the beauty in each of you. And if I, a selfish, egotistical individual, can see it, how much more can God the Father see it, and God the Son see it, and God the Holy Spirit see it, and Our Lady see it? Thank you, Fiat brothers, all of you. You're beautiful. And uh, you're called to be saints, vele, want it, and uh, be fathers. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.